All right, so welcome to another Codacy webinar. Uh, I'm Eloisa, my name is Eloisa. I'm here with the Codacy marketing team um, and I'm gonna be moderating this session. Uh, so let me quickly introduce this webinar uh, before we start. Um, today we're gonna bring in the expertise of Antoine Kras with us here today um, to talk about, this is how we accelerate with quality engineering. Uh, better yet, this is how Antoine accelerates uh, at La Redoute. That's the story we're gonna tell today. Um, so Antoine has over 10 years experience uh, in the engineering software industry, having done multiple roles from engineer to management to engineering director and others. Um, he's the founder of the Quality Engineering Unit community or QE.com, QEUnit, sorry, .com. Uh, it's a place dedicated to sharing knowledge uh, and helping organizations in their own digital transformation uh, through what is called quality at speed. And we're going to hear a little bit more about that uh, in this webinar. So Antoine is currently Director of Architecture and Technology at La Redoute. So um, if you don't know, La Redoute is um, a large international retailer with over 1 billion euros in annual sales volume. So we're very curious to know how the development team has evolved to keep up with this massive growth and how Antoine has managed to improve the engineering practices dramatically. So uh, let's go on to our agenda. Um, so this is the introduction. We're gonna let Antoine introduce himself and talk a little bit more about work at La Redoute and leading digital transformation. Um, after that, we're gonna jump straight into um, the software delivery transformation, quality engineering, the process, the story, and the road to elite engineering performance. Uh, going through after that, the accelerate metrics to uh, measure results. Um, in the end, we're gonna have a Q&A uh, to answer all of your questions. This is your opportunity to send us any question you may have using the Q&A button here uh, below in, in this webinar. Uh, ask away, ask Antoine any questions, he'll be happy to answer. Um, and, and that's it, I'm gonna stop talking now. I'm gonna let uh, Antoine talk, go ahead. Okay, thanks a lot Eloisa for the introduction. So we'll just take over the slides. So yeah, very happy to be here today to share with you with uh, Codacy. So we'll see that there is a common link between Accelerate and what Codacy is trying to do, but we'll see that through the, through the presentation. If you want to follow a bit what I'm doing, you, are the, you have the link nearby my name. So I will not repeat uh, what Eloisa presented. I just wanted to pinpoint one uh, topic, which is with the block around communities. So I'm really involved in communities because I believe we have the same problem at the same time in different organizations and in the software industry more globally. So this is why I believe we have to, to communicate and share together. And this is why also I created a QA unit to be a transversal community of software and not restricted to a specific uh, vertical. But we'll talk about that at the end. So about what is quality engineering. So yeah, let's start by uh, sharing a bit the story of Rodut. So for people that know Redoute, they, the, so the, the image of Redoute was a built this old fashioned company at some point, selling uh, big uh, catalogs every six months with an old fashioned logo like we have like that. So it was very good at some point, but we had to transform uh, with all the competitions that you know in the retail, uh, in the retail sector. So if we accelerate in time, I will just go quickly through what is Redoute today. So today we are really working building on the, the building the prefab family and lifestyle platform. We have done a lot of digital transformation. I will go have some clips here around that just after. We are, we are also a company that is building its own product with an internal designer, uh, manufacturer, and nearshore manufacturer. So it's quite a differentiator compared to other uh, actors and a, a differentiator also in this type of software we have to, to propose. We are now also uh, proposing uh, decoration and atmosphere. So everything you see in this picture can be booked at La Redoute and it has been crafted and designed by the team. So we are really involved in that space also. It was not the case, for example, in 2015, La Redoute was not designing or selling any of this type of product. The same here, completely different atmosphere. 
We have also developed other type of business lines. So La Redoute for business is a B2B uh, segment. So and I think it's uh, all of that is to give example of the type of digital transformation we had to do to generate new revenue streams. We have also reopened shops. We, we closed all of them in 2014. Now we have more than 50 pot sales in uh, Europe with a dedicated uh, brands so like La Redoute Interior or IMPM. So and if we, you need to have in mind some key KPIs, so they are mostly to, to have some reference point between the, for the story we'll be sharing. So like Eloisa was sharing, it's uh, around a billion uh, annual revenue business, uh, very known in France, it was created there. The company have 180 years of, of uh, history, so it's quite a brand with a quite a legacy in the, in, the, in the country and in Europe. In terms of traffic, it's really a high, highly digital platform. So we are one of the top 10 visited websites in France uh, so with seven unique monthly visitors and more than 40 million uh, visits. It's very critical for the business because we are selling a lot online, more than 96% online. So any description on the user experience is directly impacting uh, our transformation rate. In the transformation, we have also built for the small articles so or for the closing, one of the most automated warehouses in Europe that, have, uh, that is able to do two hours order to truck uh, processing. So if you place an order right now in La Redoute, in two hours, it is ready in the truck for departure. And we have also, also reopened a lot of shops and we are now uh, shareholders with Gary Alfay. So that's all about the number and the presentation of product. We can now start to talk a bit more about uh, engineering and software, but it's always important to start with the why and the business. And today we are here to talk about uh, Accelerate with quality engineering. But the first question to answer is why we need to accelerate in fact. So, La Redoute, when it was built, I, I was sharing the company is a 180 years uh, company. It started with uh, the mainframe. So you see here the size of the room for France. So we bought like the big mainframe. And to develop internationally, as Redoute was a precursor of uh, selling uh, retail via the mail and via the phone, we had to go very fast to deploy the model. And the, the, the plan to go very fast was to deploy in each country in parallel a dedicated IT system. So it was very fast but we also ended up with a lot of different systems. We'll come back to that later. And at that time, accelerating was not really a, 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 an issue or a need because in fact, we were producing catalog every six months. So the IT systems were fine. At, on the weekends, we were closing the call center and we were not processing mail external. So there was no big, big deal or big need for acceleration or highly user experience. And then co coming uh, into 2000, we enter the web era where we have an acceleration of the, the, the need for uh, organization to start selling online with the advent of e-commerce. So what we did in Redoute, we, we follow the trends. We build a, a website dedicated for France because it was really the main, like more than 80% of the annual revenue. And we partners with a company based in New York. And internationally, we were we, we partners with two different companies to develop specific websites for all, all the international uh, brands. And we, make, uh, we made a lot of money during that time. There was not a lot of competition. We had a website, great. But then this stopped and we had some early warning signs in the transformation. So in France, we, we had big problems due to the size and the complexity of the system. It was very hard to change and evolve the system even for not that much project. So one example we had is that we, we, we wanted to implement a project to deliver in 24 hours for our customers. It lasted more than one year when it should have been one or two quarters. And it was really complex, a lot of delays, uh, issues in quality for our customer and in the software to, to address it. And if you see below in internationally, we had much more competition from other players and venture capital. So we had already a pressure to, to accelerate. So at that time, we already have a pressure. It was not the same as of today, but we already got some type of pressure. So we worked on specific topics that you can see on the right part. So we made the first investment in web testing and we also implemented an ESB, so Enterprise Service Bus, to distribute, start to distribute applications that were all inside the mainframe for fun. On the international, the drivers were a bit different. So we had to harmonize on a single platform. It was much more around rationalization and cost cutting. And we also started to implement what was called at that time continuous integration. So we were not talking around continuous delivery. It was back in 2010, in fact. And we started doing that with a team in Portugal. Also, there will be a link in the story on that. 
So and in terms of results, so I do again like a, a go fast into the in time. So in the back office, we implemented a lot of the continuous integration paradigm, and we managed to accelerate from three months to three weeks in terms of release, and we managed to deploy from yearly to months, and we also accelerate a lot the resolution of incidents. We implemented tools like Jenkins, code quality with Sonar Cube, infrastructure as code with Puppet, a bit of unit testing to DD, and also central logging. On the web testing automation, we had a different challenge. We, in fact, it was we, need, we had to accelerate with uh, the need to have better and faster uh, validation cycle. So we, we started to create a tool that you see below in, with the logo, which is surveillance testing. Uh, I will talk a bit more just after how we accelerated much more than the stat you have here from three months to two, to two weeks. In fact, we accelerated after two daily delivery. And it was also the time when we invested a bit in system and organization. So we implemented simple process like the limit the work in progress. We also did something that not a lot of companies are doing. It was to internalize our operations. So it means that we, we created a team with people working free, with free shift of eight hours to monitor all the alerts of our website at the system, etc. because we have like 7,000 alerts. So there's a lot of jobs to look at on a continuous basis. And we also set up specific team. Again, an organization, I will have a dedicated slide on that topic later. So we, we managed to make some, pro, some progress, but in fact, in 2013, it was not enough because in 2013, the company was making 600 million in annual revenue, but we were losing 50 million a year in EBITDA. So it was, it was even better to do nothing than to have the company. We entered in a, in a drastic transformation period at that time. So we exit a group that was a PPR carrying a Red Cats, and we were alone. We had two people from the management that took over the company, and we had like four years to transform or die, in fact, because we had no other option. We didn't have anyone to back, to back us up during the transformation. And so our objective at that time, so we accelerated the report was not, not yet available. We were in 2013, but we, I found it interesting to make the parallel with the Accelerate framework right now, is that our objective, in fact, was not to go to Elite directly. It's not realistic. We had to go step by step in maturity. So our goal was to go from the pink layer to the blue layer, layer on the most critical assets to, to, to support the business transformation. So one of them, one of the critical assets was the e-commerce website. So the website and the mobile application connected to all the back office uh, system. The main business driver was not directly to accelerate. It was to to increase the, to the transformation rate of the company and to also increase the ratio of selling on the digital channel from we were around 50, 55 to over 90%. In fact, and we had to do that in four years maximum. In fact, the driver was more to do it in three years. We had also to accelerate by the ratio of 10, the cycle of uh, creation of products. So we were used to do catalog every six months. The idea was to do 20 catalogs per year much, with much more digital interaction rather than sending them by email. We had also to streamline a lot the order processing. We, have a, we are a retail business and the, 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 the job is to take orders, ship them as fast as possible to the customer without issues. We had to pass from 1.5 day to two hours of order processing. So it was a starting point. And we had also to generate new revenue streams. So historically, Rodoot was a, a pure uh, retail business only for B2C, only selling its own product it was buying. And we had to develop a lot of uh, new revenue streams. So I talked a bit around on furnitures, we had, we had also to develop the marketplace, but also to be able to test new business ideas. And here it's really linked also to the capacity to accelerate and to test rapidly business ideas. So we'll talk a bit around these, uh, these two topics. So one main driver was to uh, accelerate the web delivery and the web performance. And the other one was to work on the global architecture, so architecture of the system, but also the architecture of the organization. So I will come on that later on. But first, we'll focus on this first block on the web delivery and performance. So on web delivery, so before, in fact, doing more things that were really concrete and so on, etc., the first thing we did that took six months from the step one, from the step two, was to, to mutualize our web platform. If you remember, we had three at the beginning. We already for international mutualized into a single. So we were with two main platforms. But at the big picture of the company, it was really a big problem because we were, uh, we were having double implementation, specification, coding teams, the validation cycle, etc. So we had to make a choice of platform. 
between a big agency in New York and a small startup in Malta. As we were in a really transformation mode and we wanted to have more entrepreneurship and startup mindset to the company, we chose to collaborate with the, the startup company. And we migrated in six months the main website of France that was not, a, the, so I would say, the easiest choice at that time because France was making like 70% of the business value. So it was very risky, a very risky project to do and to move France instead of moving the countries. But it was really beneficial at the end. We'll see how. And once we have done that, we had to address a limiting factor in our, in our delivery process. So here, I simplify the standard software life cycle. So you go from the left to the right from you have a business ID, you do requirement, design, coding, you do testing, deployment. And when you are satisfied or not, you deploy to production and you, you, you validate if it provides value to the user. The problems we were having, and it's usually what happens in a lot of companies, especially when you have a monolithic architecture, and it's what we were having, we were having a, a, a monolith in the web platform. So what was happening, it was we had very slow QA and UAT cycles in a QA and UAT uh, environment. And after QA or UAT, we were usually, usually discovering blocking bugs. This was generating the need to perform fix that, that were making us entering a, again in another cycle of validation and to hopefully don't have critical bugs. But if you look at this scheme, if you, you have two, two times an issue, you already last three months to make a release to the business. So if you step back from a yearly perspective, from a business standpoint, it's like you have four opportunities in, in, the, in the year to, to improve the business. It's really not at all uh, sufficient. So we started to analyze what were the limiting factors and issues in the life cycle for that. So we were having really slow UAT and testing cycles. So due to manual and technical tests, the main, uh, the main point that were creating a lot of accidental complexity that you can see on the left. So as we were very slow to validate and we had reworks and bug fix, a lot of other changes were starting to accumulate in the, in the pipeline because we had like 30 developers working in parallel on the same code base. So then there, is, there was a lot of branching, a lot of merge, nightmare in fact. And after we had also, due to that, a lot of other problems, inconsistent environment, complex code base, and we were creating bugs ourselves. So we could have tried, for example, to say, oh, let's implement a new branching process or whatever. We didn't make that choice. We, we prefer to focus on the root cause and on the limiting factor that we described here, that were the two times two weeks uh, validation cycle in QA and UAT. So what we set up was really a process of smaller and faster releases with four main uh, focus. The first one was to invest a lot in functional test automation. So of functional test automation to reconcile business and technical teams that were not talking the same language in testing and automation to automate all tests that were pertinent to accelerate the validation cycle. The trunk-based development was useful to implement the release train, we'll see later on, but it's ready to have smaller change, much faster to production. We also implement a backup plan to avoid uh, to do a disinstallation or hotfix, etc. It was to have feature flags and A-B tests. And in order to streamline the entire flow of value, we also had to work with the business to implement incremental feature and specification instead of big blocks. So how does it look like in the chain? So in software and in a lot of practice, in fact, if you want things to happen downstream in the life cycle, you need to include them by design. So we talk a lot today in the ecosystem, observability, security by design. It's exactly what we had to do on specific requirements there. So our shift requirements were functional test automation, to define directly in the user story in a big style. The feature flag and the AB test had to be defined. Do we need a feature flag for this feature or not to be developed just after? And we had also to cut down big business ideas into smaller increments. And after, the trunk-based development was really more of a process and the technology set up inside the environment and the branch. So we set up the concept of release train that was a daily process. So we didn't say, let's try to develop uh, on a sprint basis every two weeks. We put a very hard constraint to say we will deploy every day what is ready because it will force us to remove all inefficiencies from the system from the system. So the release train we set up was to fix the scope of deployment uh, until 11 a.m. So at 11 a.m., everything that is on the, the trunk because we are using SVN or the, the, the main if you are using Git today. At 11 a.m., we take everything, we build, we deploy in QA, and we have an SLA of two hours to perform the testing automation and the validation and to after go or not in production. And after, we still have 
things to implement in production with the shift, so continuous testing and shift right paradigm. So we reused a lot of our functional tests in UAT and in production to validate what we were deploying was meeting the expectation and working as expected. And we are also investing in shift right to perform UX monitoring, A-B test, profile. So all the things that I shared by design are then implemented in production. And we also had a big plan on off fix we, that was really there not to be used. It was really a process for exception. And the result we got with this process, so it did not took three months or six months. In fact, we managed to get structuring results to deploy. We, we deployed daily from the start, but to get really much more business value, it took us like two years. Because you see on the graph, it's the, our automated test suite we are using for the digital uh, platform. So it's validating all web and mobile application uh, user experience connected with the back office. And today we have like uh, an automated test suite around 7,000 tests running every day in 50 minutes to give us the go no go to deploy in the production. And we are able to deploy on a ratio of 96%. So it means that on all business days that we can deploy outside of freeze period with the Black Friday, for example, we are able to deploy 96%. So it's uh, between 150 and 180 days a year, we do a daily deploy in production of changes. And the, the test pyramid we implemented for this specific change is what you can see sometimes in the ecosystem as a code, the cone, so the ice cream code pyramid. For us, it was very useful uh, because normally it's criticized in the ecosystem because it's slow to execute and it's flocky, so instable because you are testing the user interface. But in our case, we invested, we, did, we collaborate with a software engineer to, to deploy fixed uh, IDs for all elements in the user experience. So we solved the first problem. And we also invested a lot in our test ocean motion platform and the tool we are using, serverless testing. And today, as you saw, we are able, we are running 7,000 tests in 50 minutes. So I would say that the, the, the association of user experience tests are slow to run. It's not very the case with what we have done. And the main benefit of doing what we have done is that we focused business and product and engineering team on the same language and same testing. So they're really testing the same thing. And we were also, we are also able to capitalize on all these tests for monitoring, production, etc. And it was also a way for us to reduce drastically our effort as you see in the middle of integration test, because we had a lot of functional tests running. So it was validating us that everything was working fine within the back office. When I was talking that we were reusing a lot of tests uh, for production and the customer journey monitoring. So this is what you see in the screen. So here it's, uh, for example, all user journey we are monitoring every minute in production on all countries. So, and we are performing like a login, order pricing, a payment, etc., on a regular basis. And it helps us to be very confident around the user experience 24-7. Uh, we don't have to wait to have to customer traffic to detect issues. So, and after we, so if we look at the stats from the transformation and the results, so we, at the beginning, we were really uh, testing business ideas between three to six months. Now we are able to do it in a week or month, basically with the acceleration. We are able to deploy uh, every day, in fact, with what we, we have done. So we deploy every business day that is possible. And the testing phase has moved from two weeks to two hours, in fact, because we are running the test in 50 minutes, and then we have a set of validation, analysis, etc., to remain under the SLA, to deploy or not just after. So, and this is what we have done on the web delivery. So the goal was to accelerate from uh, every six, three months delivery to a daily. We managed to do it, but we also had to improve a lot the user experience, because we know that in the uh, in software industry, so it's why I talk a lot and I blog a lot around quality at speed, that you cannot be only fast with the speed. You need also the quality in production, because I personally, or I think you are the same. If you go on a website or you use an app that is not working, that is slow and not meeting your expectation, you disinstall it or you don't come back. So the user quality of the user experience and the operation is very important to the user traction. So this is the type of delivery we put in place, and it's also in some practice on the info queue. For example, if you look at it's all the error tracking. So we implemented very drastic resolve for monitoring in a lot of area of the business. So here you see on a lot of area of the, the user experience. So delivery, basket, to payment, etc. So every step of the customer journey is being monitored. And it's very different from what we are having before. So before, this is what IT people were looking at. So technical graphs that are saying nothing about the user experience. We only see memory, CPU, etc. 
and we don't know, in fact, the user experience is meeting the, the expectation. And with the, the, all the work we have done on a continuous basis, we managed also to get in some ranks here in the web performance. So it was just to exemplify that we managed with the work we have done to be in the top ranking, and it was not only a private work. And we were in 2017 at that time, so we were quite happy because we managed to transform the company and to still be there. In fact, so we were not closing, so we were, we we survived. And we have a new uh, a new actionary with uh, that took over 51% of ownership within the company. And at that time, so uh, we did make a lot of changes in IT, etc. But I wanted to share in relation to accelerate with quality engineering three main topics: so the organization, the culture, and the technology. So the objective at that time was to move to elite again all the critical assets of the company from the pink to the blue part. So in terms of organization, uh, it was the time when I moved as a managing the engineering team. So we were having a very dispersed, dispersed workforce in different countries with different practice and work, different culture, etc. So first focus we had was to take ownership of uh, the, the code, the entire code of the company, because we had a lot of external partners that were fully outsourced and also to concentrate teams in a single location to also grow the team, have better opportunities and consolidate knowledge. So we did that on uh, the, all the, the, the teams that you see here in pink. So we also streamlined the team in cross-functional team I will detail a, bit, detail a bit after. And we also make the same work on operation. On the operation side, we are, we are having a lot of teams in a specific external provider, multiple providers. So it was very hard for the big picture and expertise and collaboration. So we also consolidated a lot of the team in Portugal. And we consolidated in three locations. So France for the product part and all the engineering part in Portugal for development and operation. And we kept in Malta, uh, Malta sorry, all the web uh, team. We also uh, Structure the team. So it's today uh, I used the modelization of uh, team topologies from Matthew, Skel Matthew Manuel Pais and Matthew Skelton, if you are close to look at. So, and we structure the team. If you see on top left on your feature team model, today we have much more, we have around eight. And we also structure in cross functional teams, the teams that are there on the main uh, domain driven design, in fact, of the company. And we also set up some specific teams, so platform team, DBA, infrastructure, security that were not existing. And we also implemented a separation of duties on separate specific activities like the transversal middleware team and the help desk to be able to, to validate the production readiness of application and to delegate from software engineering teams the level one and level two support. And we also set up specific center of expertise so supervision, observability, quality, and later on a bit on, on cloud technology. But organization alone is nothing, in fact, because you only change organizational charts. So we had to work a lot on the culture, in fact, to change the interaction of people and really change the way we build software for the company. So when we I took over the team, we were having development and operation in separated floors, in fact. So you see the office on top left, the previous one. And we moved on the right to a single floor with development and operation. And we organized the office into the flow of work. So we set up the streamline team on the left, specific teams that require much more collaboration, like the platform team in the middle, and then all vertical expertise center of excellence on the right. We also set up transversal and specific community of practice. There, were, there was not existing to also foster an environment of continuous learning and to also identify opportunities of improvement and to also work on the empowerment and the push of uh, people. For example, we had the development communities that work jointly with the DevOps and platform team to define infrastructure library and reusable components. We also had the quality hub to talk about quality practice, not only for QA, but on tester or tester, really with software engineer, etc. So, and we had a lot of specific communities like that that we started to animate and also share much more talk globally within the company before it was really more siloed and shared and privately shared with teams to so really open up the communication channels. Uh, like and we also invested a lot in common rituals uh, team building uh, sharing between the team so you see here a picture of the team we implemented for example uh, a daily uh, meetup with all the team physical or virtual to share on all the deliveries incidents etc 
Whereas before, for example, all the incident and outline was reserved to operation team. So we changed that. We said, okay, no, it's a common responsibility. So we product, engineering, operation are sharing the same visibility and status. And we also work a lot to, to create new managerial lines that were not existing at that, at that time because we consolidated teams. So we had to create new managerial roles within the company. And we also accelerated in terms of technology. So technology was the mean to accelerate with all the other blocks, in fact. So our architecture was a bit uh, distributed due, due to the transformation, but we are still having a lot of issues. So here I will not detail the whole architecture external, it's more to give an idea, the general philosophy of what we implemented. So the key pain point we had, if we go from top to left, was our, our, our IT system was lacking transversality between new user experience, back office and data. It was also due to the organization. We had a lot of time coupling between application and a low scalability to cope with peak of demand, especially with Black Friday, holiday season, etc. It was really hard for us to parallelize development in specific critical application due to the architecture, in fact, mainly. And we had also a lack of self-service and waiting time. So the team were having a lot of, of blockers and limiting factors in the process to deliver value. So we, we invested in a specific uh, area. So here I retain the core ones. We invested in uh, event-driven microservices, not only microservices. So it's really key also for the second point of time coupling and scalability. So we implemented really decoupled the services. And we also invested a lot in self-service developer experience, engineering productivity, and adoption of cloud and SaaS platform and PaaS platform to really accelerate the iteration and the capacity to accelerate of the engineering team. So we implemented the CICD clone native uh, stack. So we were already having some type of CICD uh, stack internally, but we drastically improved it with also the 12 factor app uh, with analyzation of secrets, uh, configuration, etc. And we implemented the tools uh, that you see there and a globally distributed architecture on a much more fine and grain that, finer grain than before. So we have Kafka, the core nervous system uh, streaming all the events. And we have also after all the micro front end and micro, uh, micro front end and micro services on the back office that are collaborating. And we still have also some applications that we buy externally that are also migrating bit by bit to the cloud. And we are really accelerating in the next three years in the complete migration to the cloud for the entire landscape. We also make, made visual a bit like into other factories or other factories, the flow of work. So here it's, for example, one day in the engineering team of the flow of development between all the environment and all the engineering team. So we see how many changes are in QA, UAT and going to production on all the CICD pipeline. So it's very important for us because we really foster to have multiple commits per day from developers to have multiple depots per day in production. We also invest a lot on engineering productivity and standard components. So for example, here is what you see here, it's the Google Golden Signals. If you're interested, you can have a look. It's like what you see here, the hills, the error rate, the response time latency of all the, the services. And it helps us to have like an institutionalized approach to that and to pinpoint issues we may have. And here, it's a bit the same. It's all the standard dashboard you see. We also implement business metrics, as you can see here. So a lot of them are available by default and teams can really focus on the business value. And what we managed to implement, so not to implement, to achieve, you see here the three main steps I, I shared a bit, uh, not a bit, I shared with you around the transformation. So after all what we have done in CI, first CICD uh, implementation, we were already more or less deploying at 20 deploys per day across the entire IT system. To have an idea, we have uh, around 150 engineers. So it's to have an idea of the ratio. After we managed to accelerate more nearby 30 deploys per day in average, when we started to implement much more quality gates, etc., And then at the end, we, we accelerated even more between 40 to 60 uh, at the end right now. So, and today we are more around 60 to 80, in fact, in terms of uh, delivery. And our main focus right now is we already have a critical application inside the elite uh, COP. And our goal is to move a lot from high to elite in the coming uh, years, or months, in fact, not years, coming months. So if we step back from what we are learning, and this is what we, where we will make the, the shift with the quality engineering. So what we, are, we have, I have personally learned and within the company is that you see that in a lot of decisions we have taken, we, are, we were systematically looking at the big picture first, first. So really think across silo, not only in our local perimeter. For example, it's not because I was only managing engineering team that I should not think about what problems we could have in the product management, for example 
because it's very important to streamline the end-to-end -end flow. I will share with some Kim just after. And on methodology, we also make a few choice of methodology that were also very important to, to scale. So the idea was not to change every three months a specific method, etc. It was really to start small, but to really build foundations that can scale later on across the entire perimeter or with much more volume uh, of tests or for software change, etc. You saw that we also invested a lot in the architecture. So for us, it was really a key transformation driver to support the business transformation. So it was not technology for technology. It was really to solve business problem I exemplify. And it was really a set of incremental change we did on, again, critical assets. The idea was not to say the goal is to deploy that on all the system, on all the perimeter, etc. It was really to have an incremental, incremental approach with business value and knowing that technology alone does not solve everything. In fact, is linked with methodology, but with other areas I'm continuing to share right now. You saw that we also work a lot in the management leadership, so to drive the vision, to push the people, to transform the team, to, to explain to the team why would sometimes we have to invest more in DevOps rather than in other teams, why we have to change some specific way of working. For example, in the transformation, we had a lot of resistance to change when, for example, we wanted developers to deploy it up to production before they were only able to, to commit and it was all operation, operation doing the deployment, testing, etc. And we have to change that gradually, and it required a lot of management, governance, sharing around the team to make sure that it was understood and driving the transition. You also saw that we had to work a lot on the organization. So we had to make choices of organization. So which organizational alignment, which team are cross-functional with dedicated resources, which team are shared. So we have like a trade-off because when team are shared, they are less, res less responsive, but they can capitalize on expertise. So we had to make choices depending on the business driver and the budget and resources we had. But it was really key to align that with, with the technology and the architecture to have an alignment between what we want to do in the business and to have the entire system aligned for uh, delivery. And also when we think about the organization, for me, my, I always reinforce that is that organization alone is nothing. It's organization with interactions because it's really the interaction between people in the ecosystems that drives the change. So if we change only organizational charts, it doesn't change anything. And I think a lot of us have witnesses or lived maybe a reorganization that didn't change anything to the day-to-day -day work. So it's really reorganization that touch anything to interactions and it's a pitfall in fact of uh, transformation. And we had also to invest a lot in skills and to also develop a mindset of continuous training. So this was really a key change also with community of practice, etc. We accelerated a lot and change a lot the ecosystem and the technology people were used to work, not only with technology in you know, the day to day, but also in the architecture they have to drive, in the type of factory interaction they have to have transversally. So we really have to change that within the people. And we also had a practice that worked quite best, especially for technological part. It was to get expertise at the start, keeping the ownership internally, but get expertise to accelerate at the beginning, always keeping in mind that you should be independent in the midterm. And in fact, this led up to MAMOS. So if you see that the five domain I just shared before is the five you found here. It is a framework I, I have co-created within the QA unit and the community with some, uh, some peers. And in fact, it's really what I believe and we believe today, what we should do to achieve digital transformation. And this is what is quality engineering, is really to act in these five domains to drive transformational change in organization. And acting on these five domains leads us to, to create a quality engineering culture that is really driving the transformation and delivering quality at speed software. So you can have more information of the site if you want on the, on the guide. And if I share a bit the perspective of quality engineering, I shared in learning on methods, but it's valid for anything that we should have a, a holistic and systematic, systematic systemic approach to software if we want to deliver value and quality at speed. So quality engineering is really a paradigm that is transversal to the software life cycle. So it starts on the left from the business ideas and it goes to the deliverables and the value measurement in production to the user. So, and we really need to have this transversal approach to quality and speed for multiple uh, reasons. And the main one is uh, what we call the limiting factor of the chain link is that if you take any system, it's not valid only for software, it's valid for any system in life. It can be your organization, in fact, uh, it's, it's that the performance of your system is limited by the weakest link in your system. So if you look at a company where 
software is directly tied to the business operation and to all the user experience, the business and the software is the same. So if you want to improve your business, you need to improve your software lifecycle. And if you have a limiting factor, for example, in the planning and the DevOps part, you can, in, you can be the best people in design, in development, and in measurement. Any improvement you will do there will have quite no effect because you, your system will always be limited to the, the weakest link of quality at speed. So this is why it's very important. And it's why I believe that in quality engineering, we need that end-to-end -end and holistic vision from business ideas to operation and measurement. So you may say that in that case, quality engineering is very transversal, it's very holistic, it's like all practices, agile, DevOps, SRE, etc. So the short answer is yes. Yes, we should address the entire scope of, uh, of this practice to drive transformation. It does not mean we need to do everything at the same time. And this is why we are building in quality engineering with MAMOS a progressive framework to adopt gradually the most valuable practice depending on the maturity uh, stages. And to adopt quality engineering, you don't need to have already done Agile or DevOps. In fact, it's even better if you have done Agile or DevOps. It's not replacing this practice. It's that it, it's capitalizing on the best practice in the market. And you can also adopt quality engineering from the start if you don't have yet a lot of Agile and DevOps practice. And this is a bit the maturity stage you can see on the right. The goal each time is to, to manage to compose and to, to have the quality and speed address on the entire life cycle, like you see on the right, without uh, blanks uh, like you see on the left. So this is the type of examples of uh, methodology you can find in the quality engineering framework. So here is an example of practice of uh, methodology, but there is a lot of content also on architecture, on management, on organization and skills. You can find all of that on the website for free. It's an open community. We have also written a book with a colleague, Jamie DeWitt, on defining quality engineering. So if you are interested to know a bit more about what is quality engineering, you can go there. I'm also sharing some weekly news around quality engineering with the worldwide community. You can go there if you are interested. And there is also an open Slack of QA unit that you can join freely. So there is open sharing space. You can get a mentors if you want, and you can also ask questions if you want around quality engineering. And it's very uh, transversal community. So it's not only for QA, it's not only for managers, it's not only for CTO, it's for people that want to deliver better software with quality of speed. So if you are convinced by that, you are happy to join. I'm happy that you join that community. So and thanks for your time and listening. Thanks also for Codacy for the opportunity. And I think we have some time for a Q&A right now. Thank you, Antoine. Uh, thank you so much for this. Let's jump into the Q&A because we have a few minutes. Um, I'm going to say the first question came through the chat. Uh, it's from Paul Ireland, and I think he's asking about uh, some of the data that, that was shown. 7,000 tests run in 50 elapsed minutes, so lots of isolated tests running in parallel and mostly API rather than UI, so I think he's asking if this is the case. Yeah. Yeah, so in fact, yes, we're running these tests in, uh, in 50 minutes. So within these 7,000 tests, you have around 1,500 that are mobile tests, so the mobile application, and the rest is on the website. They are not uh, that isolated test, and they are not that only API test. In fact, they are user experience tests simulating a user on the user interface, and they are not necessarily isolated because they can simulate a lot of user scenarios that can happen right now in the website of Odoot. So we don't have this uh, complexity. And it means that, yes, so we have to invest a lot in our infrastructure. So we have like 150 robots to scale the execution of all the tests. And we have to invest a lot in our testing environment to be quite near the production one with automated data refresh, etc. So this test behind the scene may be performing API calls, but because we are clicking on buttons, etc. But it's really, uh, yeah, so user experience test, not that much API, and they are running in parallel to simulate the business behavior. And it's mainly to validate the entire set of uh, Business behavior, in fact, yeah. Thank you. Awesome. We have some more questions in the Q and A. So, one attendee asked, "Do you do you use trunk-based development?" Yeah. So, uh, what I presented on the process of season thousand test is focused on the digital platform, so it's a web and mobile application. So. On there, we are, we, we are using a trunk-based development because we are still on SVN and it's, it have already started to move with the micro front end on Git, etc. 
on the back office, it's also it's also on Git. So what we are using on the, this part of Git, on Git is a GitHub flow. So in fact, it's it's uh, the concept of frame-based development because you have only uh, quite a main line that you always develop, but we have a branch for peer review and validation, etc. Before going to the main one, that is then uh, going directly to production. So the short answer is yes, but with a specific model for Git, which is GitHub Flow, for the vast majority of what we are building today. Great. Um, one more question. Uh, we have two questions from Neil Younger. I'm going to read the first one. If you were to go through your transformation journey again, what would you do differently uh, based on what you know now? Yeah, I think uh, a lot of things, in fact. So uh, I think there is too much examples to take of what we could have done better on the method, architecture, etc. I think if, if I need to take some examples, I think it would have been to to invest much more in the, the transformation of people, the skills, the mindset, etc. Because it's, it, I was talking about limiting factor and a lot of time it was not technology or me having the ideas on some people to change things that was too slow. It was the adoption of people and the resistance to change. So for me, I, I would invest much more in that, into the transformation, leading, pushing people and explaining them the transformation. Uh, because yes, I think I have the tendency sometimes to be too task focused. And in fact, you need to very equilibrate the people part uh, to drive better the transformation. And it's not easy because you need to invest a lot before and you have a delay feedback loop between your action and the result. So it's quite uh, yeah, a challenge on that. So my, my advice and my personal learning team will be this that one. Yeah. Oh, and uh, to follow up on that is the quality culture transition guide. Um, so you mentioned that. Is that from Alan Page? Okay. Yeah. So I, I have in the slide, yes, the quality culture guide in, in, where the slide in quality engineering when you have all the practice, SRE, DevOps, etc. So there is, yes, where, what it was mentioned there was the quality culture guide from Alan Page, you are right. But what we are building in the quality engineering framework and when I talk about culture in the middle, it's not only the quality culture guide from Alan Page. In fact, we are building within the community the, the quality engineering uh, guide that is that may reuse some part of uh, Alan Page One, normally not that much, but it will be released a QA, uh, QA unit one, yeah. All right, oh, we have one more question. Uh, okay, one more question by Leo Miller is asking, why so few unit tests and so much upper level approaches? Again, we need to have uh, in mind the different perimeters. So what I presented with a few unit tests, we still have a, a major unit test in the digital platform. So on the back end, we have the inverse approach. We have much more unit tests and integration tests, I would say, so the much more standard approach because also it's back end services with API, etc. But on the digital part, we had much more, uh, I would say, uh, user experience tests for multiple reasons. So the main gaps we are having was between business and technology team. So they were, they were not talking together on the user experience, the customer journey, the user path, etc. Our uh, engineering team in Malta were external and not that linked with the, the, the product and engineering team we had uh, internally, and they were more on the XP model, etc. So uh, if we look at that, we could have said, yeah, let's do a lot of unit tests uh, to try accelerate. I think we, should, we would have not reached the same result because we will always add the issue of translating what the unit tests are done into business validation, etc. And we will not have, have a bit of that much collaboration and shared vision about the business improvement, business iteration. And we, today we have a major uh, quality ownership of the digital platform from the business. We have, we have a quality roles of software within the business division and product management, which was not the case before. And I'm convinced that if we had invested much more in unit tests rather than upper level, we would, we would have been much more slower to transform the company and we would have probably failed to do daily delivery because the developers would have been deploying and validated with unit tests. But then the business would have said, oh, no, I want to validate on my hand. I don't trust your unit test. It's technical, etc." So yes, it was a trade-off. Today, we are equilibrating a bit. And while, where, when we are doing micro front-end, in fact, we are much more equilibrating the pyramid. And we are also doing much more localized tests rather than the full test of the platform because our architecture is more distributed. So we are able to do that right now. Okay, thank you. So we still have a few minutes. Uh, we have enough time to answer more questions. So 
Any more, any more questions from the audience? Anything that's on your mind? Oh, we have one. Um, so was there any resistance from development, from management to implement the, change, the changes needed to go from low to medium or high performer? Yes, we had a lot. And it way for me, the management part is essential. So for example, uh, we had developers that didn't want to go up to production because it means that they should have to handle the hotline after. We had operation people that didn't want developers to go to production because after they think they will be caught first. So we had to say, no, we inverse, we adapt the responsibilities. We had management uh, when I pushed for cloud native technology, etc. We had a lot of manager people and event director of operation, etc. They didn't want to adopt cloud technology, SaaS solution, etc. They said, no, we need control, we keep compromise. Uh, it's very risky, let's do like we do as a geo, etc. So yes, there was a lot of resistance to change, but also a lot of, uh, I would say, resistance for people to become true managers and leaders rather than managing their own silo. And so we had to push a lot of people in transversality and work beyond their comfort zone and the people they know. So yes, there was a lot of resistance to change. And for me, it's really about having always in mind to transition uh, transition model, I talk more, much more around transition management rather than change management, because what you have to do is to manage ecosystem of transition to manage change. It's not a one day you manage a change and everything change. In fact, you need to manage specific level of transition in, uh, in maturity. So yeah, there was really a lot. I think the main one, yeah, as the example I did, it was uh, letting people go up to production because sometimes there was not enough tests, etc. But we made it clear, if there is an issue in production, it's the responsibility of the engineering team lead. Don't use the excuse of the operation people that didn't validate what you have done, for example. Yeah. Great, I hope that answered your question. Any more questions from anyone? We have a few minutes left. We can still answer a question. Anything you'd like to ask Antoine or share your experience, share your thoughts? Oh, well, for me, I think I shared the main idea. So we have, I have a bit more talk available if you, if you have a look at my profile on LinkedIn, mainly. But yeah, feel free for me to join the QUnit if you're interested. We are international community. But yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think for me, already the key takeaways is to act on these five uh, axes of MAMOS to drive changes. Mm -hmm. Awesome. We do have one last one. Um, so how does engineering culture fit into the equation? What had to change in terms of organization and culture? Well, for me, really, the quality culture is really what it's the end result of addressing all the other part of the MAMOS framework. Because in fact, the, what we had to change in culture, but it was a lot, for me, it's a lot around transversality and the perception people have of their work, their contribution, and how they should interact with each other, and what is their business contribution or value contribution to the business. For example, we had a lot of uh, people, developers, that think their job was only to code and to, to commit uh, and to go at the end of the day at their home. We push a lot around, uh, we need to go beyond understanding what is uh, the business value, what you are trying to develop, etc. So if you don't know, ask, talk to the guy, etc. So don't uh, stay uh, hidden behind your desk and your screen. And after you have, your goal is to go up to production, do progressive delivery, manage the business risk, and talk with the product management to make sure the change are delivering value. So we have to change a lot uh, that part. And for me, I think the quality culture is really about changing the individual perception of what is my role in the global organization and in transversality? So people need to have this picture. They don't have always to contribute on the big picture, but they have to be clear in the value chain where do they contribute. And after you need to create a shared mindset and an organization of culture that say, we are there to deliver quality of piece software, we are transversal. So like that, you remove a bit the local tribes and the local silo you can have in teams. And the issue with that for me is that people after tend to take, to take negative and local decisions. So I think really, the quality culture is about opening the global perception of quality at speed contribution for people to take globally better decision. And for example, instead of doing a four project in four different teams along the software life cycle, you only do one on the limiting factor first and you optimize a lot the software life cycle and the company investment. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, one more question. Uh, this is also from Paul Ireland. 
I think this is a follow-up question. I think, he says, I think that your ice cream cone approach is quite non-standard. How do you cope with the maintenance of 7,000 mostly UI tests with changing UI elements, et cetera? Yeah, right. So it's not standard. But I have always a drastic test for things. Does it work? It works for what we are doing. Uh, we have also an article on Laroduta.io blog if you want to have a look on in detail how we do that. But to answer your question on how do we cope with the maintenance, so for me, we apply the same type of good practice or best practice of software to testing. And I think a lot of teams are not doing it. So for me, one best practice is the test design and test readability. So I think a lot of people are implementing tests in a, a way, copy paste, a procedural way, etc. What we did is that in our tool, but a lot of test automation tool uh, are supported, but with serverless testing, we have a, a modular approach to test automation. So we have all the user journey and user paths that are very modular, and all the objects are in the data library or variabilized. So in fact, it allows us to have a quite reduced maintenance, maintenance effort, because today we have three people working on the implementation and maintenance of these tests. So it's not that much looking at the number of uh, tests. And for me, we are really applying this type of best practice. We also work a lot with uh, development to inject fixed ID in all the elements of the user interface, because it's a lot of things people are not doing, for example, and after testers are failing because the, the user interface element are, are, are unstable, etc. So we invested a lot on that. Right now, it's a bit more easier because our product have a self-healing capabilities with a static, statistical algorithm and not an AI a data science algorithm. So we don't need history and it works. But I would say for me, the short answer is the maintenance is test modularity, test design, in fact, and we have a, co a shared ownership between business and IT teams and QA teams around the referential of tests. Because in fact, the referential of tests represents the business behavior we expect from the digital platform. So in fact, it's a, this is the approach we have. And I think the fact also to do daily delivery is like a daily test of our, of our daily test of our test. So if tests are unstable or whatever, they are quickly need to be fixed or removed because they are not helping and they are slowing down the ride. So I think it's also a key element for us is to have this very frequent feedback loop around the if our of our test suite. Because if you have a test suite that is slow, you run every two weeks or every four weeks uh, on a sprint in agile mode. Yes, if it fails after you you say, ah, but yeah, just, let's just by, bypass it or whatever. Yeah. Uh, okay. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, thanks everyone for asking your questions. Uh, we managed to answer them all. We are running out of time. So uh, I'd like to thank, thank Antoine. Great. Lots of interesting insights here today. Uh, and thank everyone for coming. Uh, don't worry, we'll share this recording with you um, in, in a couple of days. So you can look back if you missed anything. Um, and yeah, that's it. So thank you. I hope to see you at your next webinar. Um, feel free to connect with us, with Antoine. And yeah, please take time to answer the survey at the end. Um, and that's a wrap. Right. <laughs>